unusual. Who gave you that name and what does it mean? Look, um, my mother gave me the name. I don't know what she was thinking when she gave me the name. You know, if she was still alive, I would ask her. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a beautiful name. I love it. Um, well, you must like it because you gave your son the same name, right? I did. I did. <laughs> and now I've got a lot of... Uh, I think I've got, I've got three nephews named after me as well. Really? Because that get confusing at Christmas. It's it still does sometimes. <laughs> Everybody gets the Everybody, same Everybody, yes. <laughs> Now, your childhood home, I believe, was a place called Messina, is that correct? That's correct. In the northernmost town in the Limpopo province of South Africa. What was life like in that place in that time? Because I think as outsiders, we often focus on Cape Town and Johannesburg. But what was life like in that smaller community? Look, it was really tough. Uh, you know, if you, you know, I, I, grew, I was born during that apartheid time, you know, during when South Africa was ruled by a racist regime. Uh, and, and the funny thing about it is, uh, I don't know if you're aware of the AWB, you know, they used to be called the African Via Sanbe uh ruled by terror. Blanche, you know, they were like the Ku Klux Klan of South Africa, uh, and, and they originated in, in the Northern Pro Province, which is where I came from. It's now called Limpopo. Um, so, you know, you, you could imagine, you know, what I had to deal with every day. Uh, you, it was... It, 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 it was bad on a daily basis, you know, having to deal with racial, you know, discrimination. But, you know, apart from that, you know, I, I come from a very poor family, you know, and, and, and when I say poor, I mean, like, there were times where we would go by without a meal, you know, and uh, look, I didn't even start school until I was nine years of age. And uh, when I started school, I had to find a job, you know, I would finish school and go work in other people's homes, you know, uh, cleaning their gardens or their, you know, their houses so that I could pay for my school fees and my school uniform. So it was really tough, you know, growing up in, uh, in, in Messina. Um, but apart from that, you know, there was also a lot of gangs, you know, where, you know, where I come from, you know, almost every kid walked around with a knife or a gun. So, you know, every day you were just risking with your life. So from birth, you were very aware that there was a, a distinct separation between yourself and your family and the white people that lived in the same region. Oh, yeah. You, I mean, we had to deal with it every day. And I mean, uh, we were not allowed in certain places. For example, you know, whites had their own restaurants. Uh, you know, you couldn't share a bus, you know, with, with white people. You couldn't share a toilet with white people. You couldn't go to certain parks because they were purely for white people. So, you know, you had to be aware of it, you know. Um, um, it, I mean, it was... It was tough, even the way we were treated, you know, uh, from childhood, you know, you would know that, you know, you, you, you know, as a black person, you, you, you were treated as a, as a savage, you know, as a subspecies in your own country, country of birth. So it was tough growing up, you know, in South Africa. As you said, you didn't have much education as a child, but I believe you started attending school at nine. Is that correct? That's correct. So was that when you moved to Zimbabwe? Yes, we had to move to Zimbabwe to, to start school, you know, um, one of the reasons was because we didn't really believe in the Bantu education system in South Africa, which was a, an educational system that was pretty much designed, you know, to fail black people. And I, although my parents were not educated, you know, my mother had up to year five education. My father had to teach himself to write. You know, the funny story about it is, you know, his name was Freddie, and sometimes he would mix up, you know, his B's with his D's, and sometimes he, when he writes his name, you know, it would be Freddie no. instead of Freddie. Um, but yeah, look, you know, we, you know, we felt Zimbabwe had a better educational system, and uh, you know, my, our parents decided we would move to Zimbabwe and start school there. So, when you did move across the river, essentially, w was there a drastic difference in your life? Did things change radically? Look, it was moving from, you know. Look, there wasn't much any changes because when we got to Zimbabwe at the time, um, you know, Robert Mugabe's you know, uh, Zanu PF had just, you know, taken over from Ian Smith. Um, but the problem then, there was so much black on black violence. Uh, you know, the parties, you know, um, the black parties in, in, in Zimbabwe were fighting at each other. You know, we had the Zanu PF and the Zapo PF and Muzorowe, Muzorowe's uh, party. You know, they were killing each other. Uh, and, and, you know, 
I mean, we were exposed to the civil war that went on for a while. So that was after the British left, essentially. Was, it was a colony until, I think, 1980, was that? 1980, yes, yes. Uh, but by 1979, what happened was by 1979, uh, Abel Muzorewa had taken over. But then by 1980, that's when they had, uh, the, you know, the first uh, democratic elections and, and Robert Mugabe won. And Obviously, outside of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe's reputation is not great. Did you immediately know that this man was going to wreck the country, or did you have faith that he would be a good leader? It's funny you mentioned that because, you know, when he came into power, you know, we loved him. You know, we felt everybody, you know, was so pleased. You know, we, we especially coming from South Africa, you know, and we, we could see that it was eventually black people in a neighboring country had just taken over their country and then in the, in the beginning Mugabe was a great man you know he was you know he did the right thing in the beginning but you know like every other African leader you know he tried to stay in power too long and uh, and and that's where it all started and he did everything he could to stay in power and it eventually ended up destroying the country under the British uh, sort of colonial rule that you saw at the end of in Zimbabwe and the the tail end of the Dutch rule in South Africa. Do you think either of those colonial powers was one worse than the other, or were they equally terrible? Well, look, I think they were equal. You know, if you live in a country where you you know you don't have a right to vote in your own country, it, it, it's bad. I mean, the same applied in both countries. You know, um, although the only difference was uh, you know uh, in South Africa, you know, apartheid was legislated. You know, I think that's what really made a big difference. So it was official, it was a formal... It was, yes, policy. it was, yeah. Mm. You know, but this is where I always tell people, you know, um, you know, um, uh, apartheid, you know, is a problem of the world. You know, uh, just because it's not legislated it doesn't mean, you know, um, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. you know, and I always tell people, you know, you know, I find a lot of people try to blame their failures on apartheid. You know, South Africa became a democratic state in 1994. And it's been, nine, you know, 26 years, you know, since the country, you know, has been a democratic state. But apartheid didn't die, you know, when South Africa became a democratic state. Because, you know... Um, as, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, you know, if you taught someone, you know, um, from, um, you know, succeeding in whatever they're doing, uh, only because they happen, you know, to be of a, you know, um, to be black or white or, you know, of a different race or, you know, uh, because of the sexual pre preference, you know, that, that, that is apartheid. It doesn't have to be legislated to exist. And this is happening around the world. And how many times do we hear of people being denied, you know, opportunities to excel because they happen to be gay mm -hmm. or they happen to be, you know, of a different race? You know, so as far as you taught someone from excelling, that's apartheid. It doesn't have to be legislated to, you know, um, to exist. During your youth, you saw obviously quite a lot of violence, as you said, between different groups and gangs. I think one incident that really stands out is when you saw your friend um, being shot when you were 13. How does anyone recover from that kind of trauma as a child? Look, that was sad, but, you know, you look at it, that wasn't gang-related. You know, that had more to do with the politics. You know, um, that was, my friend got shot during a protest. You know, at the time, we were protesting, you know, against, you know, um, uh, the government filling our schools up, you know, with white teachers. Uh, whereas black teachers were not allowed, you know, to teach in white schools. Uh, so, you know, and we felt that was their way of trying to, you know, to enforce us to continue, you know, with this Bantu education, which was pretty much, you know, like I've already said, you know, designed to fail us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we took it up in the street, you know, to protest. And, and, you know, during one of the protests, you know, my friend got shot, you know, he died in my arms. You know, look, it, it's... It's traumatic. I mean, you know, I, I'm still dealing with it up to this day. You know, there are sometimes, you know, you know, sometimes I wake up, you know, you know, you know, having my nightmares. You know, it's it's something. You know, the scars are there forever. Mm -hmm. There were a number of other incidences that you recount in the book about atrocities that you witnessed. Do you think, at what point do you think you started to feel a genuine sense of rage that started to come out in yourself? And was it just because of what was going on all around you? Or was there something innate? Like, how did you eventually realise that you needed to sort of use your fists to defend yourselves and your family? Look, I, I think from, 
you know, I would say from, you know, maybe around age six, seven, when I started realizing what was going around, you know, in my community, you know, all this rage started building up, you know, uh, and I'll be the first one to admit that, you know, I was a very, very angry young man, you know, growing up, and, you know, and, and I think it had to do with, you know, the environment, you know, that I grew up in, you know, and uh, everything, all the atrocities, you know, that I had to witness, um, you know, um, and, 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 you know, I recall, you know, the, you know, my way of trying to deal with it was through sports. You know, I tried all types of sports, you know, um, and I was also a good soccer player, you know, but because of my anger, you know, I didn't last long in soccer, you know, because, you know, uh, if everybody, if someone played rough against me, I would knock them out. So, and then I'll get kicked out of the field. So I didn't last long. Often people would see me chasing another player instead of chasing the ball. <laughs> and people used to play his bet, play his best to see how long I was gonna last, you know, in the field. And, and I recall, you know, one incident, you know, I knocked this kid out cold, you know, and then they got a you know, security guard, you know, to escort me out of the field. And as he was walking me out of the field, he said to me, kid. I don't think soccer is, is for you. I don't think, you know, you don't last too long, in, you know, in, in the field, mm. you know. I think you should try boxing, you know. And I thought, wow, I've got nothing to lose. So the next day I went to the boxing gym. It turned out this guy was a boxing trainer and he was also a boxer himself. And then, you know, he introduced me, introduced me into boxing. And then he said, look, first thing we need to work on is your anger. I didn't believe that because, you know, I thought, you know, to fight you needed to be angry. But I was wrong because... If you look at boxing, boxing is scientific. You know, it's like playing chess. You gotta think. You know, and but it outsmart the opponent. Yes, mm. yes, that's how it works. And you know, uh, the way I, you know, the best way to explain it. You know, for example, if you got a problem and you're trying to solve a problem, you know, you can't solve it when you're angry. You need to calm down. Okay. So it took me you know, uh, some punishment to understand that, you know. Uh, my trainer put me in sparring and, you know, I was getting beat up because I was all, always angry. You know, I couldn't counter punch, I couldn't counter react because I was, I was angry. And eventually I listened to him and I realized when I calm, when I, when I was calm and collected and I was, you know, I was doing well. And then eventually, look, it changed me as a person, you know, so I'm, I'm very grateful to boxing, you know. You know, I, I became this calm and collected person that I am today. And, and like I said, you know, you know, growing up in South Africa at the time, almost every teenager walked around with a knife or a gun. Now, had I not changed my attitude, had boxing not changed me, I probably, you know, would be dead today or locked up in jail. So in a way, boxing disciplined me, changed me from this angry young man to the person that I am today. And I'm grateful. All right, well, I'm going to go to another song quickly. This is called Like, and it's by Ned Sayi.
was like by singer-songwriter Net Sayi. She was brought up in London after her parents fled what was then known as Southern Rhodesia, but they returned to modern-day Zimbabwe in 1980 when she was seven years old after the country finally gained independence from the British. Suddenly surrounded by a mosaic of music, including Congolese kwasa, South African jazz, Zimbabwean jit and um, Mbira, a US R&B and the roots of hip hop, music was a part of every aspect of her life. And she says from church to home and at public celebrations, music provided a stable place for her in an otherwise chaotic world. Now, if you're just tuning in, I'm joined for the whole of today's show by Lovemore and Doe, a world champion boxer and lawyer who now resides in Sydney. Now, we spoke a lot before that track about your childhood. And you started to talk about boxing and it calming you down as a young man from just being outwardly, you know, uncontrolled rage to being more strategic and, and thinking more about your opponents. When did you start to think this could actually be a legitimate career for me? Like not just a hobby, but a real job? Okay. I've always, you know, growing up, you know, I've always thought, you know, um, my ticket, you know, out of, um, you know, apartheid South Africa, you know, uh, would be sports. So, you know, that's why I tried a lot of sports. Uh, like I already explained to you, you know, I didn't last long in the, in the field when I played soccer. But when I eventually took, took up boxing, I fell in love with the sport. And I realized, you know, this, this was the sport, you know, that was going to check me where I wanted to go, you know, um, away from South Africa, away from apartheid. So, yeah, you know, I've always known that, you know, through sports, I could make, make my way out of, you know, um, apartheid South Africa. But did you, I mean, one doesn't just become a world champion boxer. How much of your life did you have to dedicate to it? Like, did it just completely take over as soon as you stepped in the ring and you thought, this is it? No, 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 it wasn't that easy, you know. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, it was hard in the beginning, you know. In fact, I, when I started my career in, in South Africa, you know, um, although they had already changed their laws, you know, usually they, initially they used to have, um, you know, a champion, you know, a white champion and a black champion in every division, you know, and then eventually they decided to form one organization, you know, where you could just have uh, one champion irrespective of color. But despite that, you know, it was really hard, you know, for a black fighter to be to be a white fighter because all the officials were white, and you know, pretty much you could beat up your white opponent and drop them, you know, knock them down every round. If you don't knock them out, as long as they last, you know, uh, they finish the fight on their you know, if they still, if the fight finishes and they're still on their feet, they'll win on points. So it was really hard. So, um, that's why, as an amateur, you know, I won most of my fights, you know, on knockout. And I had, you know, 68, you know, um, uh, amateur fights, you know, um, I won 66, and, you know, 58 of those were by knockout. Um, so you really made sure there was no doubt, like, you were the winner. <laughs> I had to make sure, yeah, you know, otherwise I knew if it went the distance and if my opponent happened to be white, then chances were, you know, I was going to lose it. Um, but, you know, Apart from that, you know, boxing is a very, there's a lot of politics involved in the sport, you know, even after I turned professional, you know, uh, it was hard again, you know, in South Africa as a black fighter, you know, to get sponsorships, you know, as a fighter, you need some sponsorships and, you know, you need to be marketable too as well. So I wasn't getting all the opportunities to be on TV or, you know, but, it, you know, some of my teammates who were white and, you know, who are used to beat up in sparring every day, you know, we're getting all these opportunities, you know, they're becoming world champions. Champions. Well, I'm, I was just sitting there and waiting and helping, help, helping them up, you know, with sparring, and and it all came down again, you know, to the to skin color, uh, you know, and then I realized, you know, I really needed to get out of the country. Did you have any idols, any black fighter idols that you looked up to, uh, even overseas? Oh yeah, I did definitely. You know, in fact, back then in South Africa, when I was up and coming fighter, you know, we had uh, a fighter called Dingan Tobela, you know well known as the Rose of Soweto, you know, um, he was my, you know, I, you know, I, I, I looked up to him, you know, everybody loved him, you know, but, you know, international, you know, I always looked up, you know, 
to, to the great Muhammad Ali, you know, uh, but, you know, even Tyson, you know, when he was young, you know, up and coming, you know, he was ferocious. I loved the guy. I loved his style. You know, I always dreamt, you know, of one day becoming, you know, as ferocious as Tyson, you know, and then, you know, there were some great, you know, old fighters, you know, like, you know, Sugar Ray Robinson. I love Sugar Ray Robinson. And then you got the, you know, the likes of Sugar Ray Leonard, Thomas, Thomas Hans, you know, Roberto Duran. Uh, you know, I love those, those fighters. This might sound a bit of like a stupid question, but did the Rocky films do anything to, like, help? Because in that, there are many different nationality fighters who all play together. Did that help sort of break down some of the barriers, or is that just ridiculous? <laughs> You're laughing at me, so I feel like maybe that is ridiculous. <laughs> look, look, the, the movie itself was very inspirational, you know, but that movie got a lot of white boys beat up, you know, because a lot of Italian boys, all of a sudden, they thought they could fight. <laughs> <laughs> I can be surprised to slow my yeah, And they got beat up. You know. <laughs> no, but look, you know, it was very, it's, it's a very touching story, you know, and, um, you know, it, it, it motivated me as a fighter. I kept watching all the Rocky, you know, I watched all the Rocky Balboa movies. And, uh, yeah, it's motivational and inspirational, but, you know, you know, the movie is a movie, you know, it's separate from the real thing. Sure. You know, when you get into, in, into, into a real fight, it's different. So when you came, how did you end up coming to Australia with boxing? How did that come about? Okay, so... In 1995, I got an opportunity to come fight in Australia. Had you ever been to Australia? No. Did you know anything about Australia? No, no. <laughs> I, I'd never been overseas. Wow. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd never been on a plane. That was my first trip overseas and first time on the plane. Uh, but I recall before coming here, I did some research, you know, uh, about Australia. And, and, and I recall, you know, reading somewhere, they were talking about, you know, Australia has got this, uh, used to have this, you know, keep Australia white policy. And, and I was concerned coming to Australia then. Um, but then, you know, when I came over um, and I remember, you know, I, I fell in love with the country. And, and the reason I fell in love with the country was the reception that I received when I came to this country. You know, here I was, you know, a black fighter coming uh, from South Africa, you know, which was, again, you know, like I've already said, you know, a racist regime at the time. And, and I've read this about, you know, keeping Australia, you know, white, and I'm thinking, wow, these people are going to treat me pretty much the same way as, you know, the white South Africans treated me. But no, you know, they didn't see a black man in me. They saw another human being. So that touched me. I fell in love with the country. And I remember going back to South Africa. I was married at the time. And I told my wife, I said, we're moving to Australia. You know, she thought I was joking. And then six months later, you know, we decided to move to Australia. And I recall before leaving, some people told me, oh, I love them. They're going to send you back on a boat. <laughs> but look... Today, I'm grateful I made that move, you know, because this country has been great to me, great to my family. This family, this country provided me with opportunities, you know, that my own country of birth, you know, wouldn't provide. I am who I am today because of this country. You know, I was able, you know, to, to pursue my boxing career here and eventually become a three times world champion. I was able to enroll in university and study, you know, I'm, Today, I'm the most educated boxer, you know, if not out here that I've ever lived. Yes, don't you have seven degrees, is that right? Yes, and it's all <laughs> thank you to Australia and all the opportunities the country gave me. But you must have had, I mean, surely you must have had some negative experiences with racism in Australia. I can't imagine it's been perfect, because even today we have very serious problems with, with racism here. Oh, uh, look... <laughs> I've, I've had some experiences where, you know, one would think, you know, I'm on racism, you know, but based on that, I wouldn't say, you know, the country is racist. No. You know, uh, you are always going to face one or two people, you know, who, um, you know, got that, uh, you know, racism in them. Like, you know, like Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton once said, you know, we all got a bit of apartheid in us, you know, because if you look at someone, I don't like them because they're Asian. That's apartheid. If you look at someone and say, I don't like that guy because, you know, he's Aboriginal, but he's never done anything wrong to you. That is apartheid. Look, I, I can give you some examples of what, you know, you know, one would say, you know, was a racial encounter. You know, like, um, I recall, you know, when I, um, some of you will remember when I dated Lauren Eagle, 
um, some years back, and I recall we were working one day in the street, and then these two guys pulled up in a car, and, uh, you know, they started making some racial, you know, uh, comments, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, to a point where, you know, they said some stuff to Lauren that I felt, you know, they were being very disrespectful, so I responded. And then they jumped out of the car to attack me. And then Lauren ran into the police station. We were just next to the police station. She runs into the police station. She tells the police, oh, these two guys are attacking my boyfriend. Okay? About six cops came running. Okay? I'm standing in there in the middle of the street with those guys you know, trying to attack me. The police come. So who do the police, you know, grab? The police grab me. They don't grab the two guys. You know, it wasn't up until Lauren said, you idiots. You know, I said the two guys. So now, how did they mistake mistaken the two? You know, two. You know, a black guy, two two guys with a black guy. Mm. So that. See, that sounds that, creepy. That's racial that profiling. That sounds very bad to me. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's obviously, obviously it's not as extreme as what you saw in South Africa, but for me, that is that's shameful. What makes me feel it is, terrible. It is. So that's just one other incident. Mm -hmm. And I also remember when I first became a lawyer, you know, I would walk into the courtroom, then I'll go sit at the bench, and then a court officer will come up to me and say, oh, no, no, this is reserved for lawyers.